In today's podcast, I'm going to be speaking with Adrienne Daly. She's the founder of Mind Aligned Hypnosis, and we are going to be covering topics such as addiction, alcoholism, its effects, and hypnosis. Enjoy! So you started your business, Mind Aligned Hypnosis, this year. Um, like, how's that been, starting something kind of in the pandemic, towards the end of the pandemic? Has it been quite tricky, or have you had to work differently, do you think? So I have, I mean, it's been great for me because everything can be done online, mm -hmm. and I'm able to see all my clients online. So that's, that's very useful. Um, as far as having remote business. Um, starting the business in general has been quite um, some very uncomfortable times for me because I've, I'm not a marketer. Mm. You know, I can, I can do the work, um, like as far as working with the clients, that's where my comfort zone is. Um, but doing the marketing and starting up the business has been a whole learning experience for me. And, um, something I'm still I think is just a continued learning um but th that's been fairly challenging when you set up your own business like you have to wear so many hats and do so many different things besides the thing that you really want to do <laughs> yeah absolutely and from um what I've learned it's kind of like the 80 20 rule um now about 80 percent marketing and 20 percent time with your clients mm, that's a lot oh that's a big that is a lot <laughs> considering I, I like you know i didn't go to mar i didn't go to school for marketing so we just kind of i took a program um uh just before i launched the business i started it, did the program in december um just so i knew kind of what to yeah. do so now i have the method and it's just about reaching as many people as possible mm -hmm. i know Google, yeah. they do a free digital marketing course, um, which you should be able to find online. I did that and that was quite helpful for like learning a little bit about marketing. Um, so yeah, just a little <laughs> helper. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, nice. Anything helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you've, uh, your, your business focuses on um, hypnosis for people with a alcohol addiction and you've kind of struggled a bit with addiction in the past yourself um like how did that happen was that something that um you were just kind of in a bad place in life or is it something that you found was you know you'd have one drink a day two drinks a day and then it's three drinks a day four drinks a day or do you know it kind of snowball effect because I feel like mm -hmm. snowball effect things like it's so easy to just like snowball into something absolutely yeah and I think like I started right away when I was a teenager um I just really liked drinking mm -hmm. I wasn't a very confident person I had some um problems with that and alcohol just made me feel mm -hmm. better so I, I could drink a lot more than other people um and it quickly became a crutch. Like I think we, you know, we start recreational drinking when we're like 16, 17. And then by the time I went to college, when I was 19, it was already a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, um, so it continued. Um, I, by the end I couldn't work and I couldn't pay my bills. Like I was just like alcohol had completely consumed me. Um, so I sobered up when I was 27. So it's been just over nine years now. Wow. Uh, yeah, that I've been sober, but it wasn't easy. I mean, I had to do, um, you know, detox multiple times. I went to rehab and relapsed the day I came out. Um, and then I lived in a sober living home for eight months. And that is where something clicked in my mind and I didn't want to do it anymore. That was that like the turning point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I relapsed a few times at the beginning of being in the house. Um, and then my last beer just ended up being my last beer. And, uh, um, I, I kind of white knuckled it for a while. You know, you're still obsessing about it and you can't let go of the idea of never drinking mm -hmm. again. Like that's just, 
the mind does not like it when you tell it mm. no. Um, and then it, I don't know exactly when it happened, but um, my brain just kind of switched over and it realized how toxic it was for myself. And uh, like today I could serve it. I could have it in my fridge. I could go to a party or concert. It, it doesn't bother mm-hmm. me at all anymore. Um, I know that for some people they struggle forever. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's always something that they have to avoid. Um, and I want to try to, um, you know, educate people that it doesn't have to be like that. Mm-hmm. And you can live a life where it's just not a problem. It's just something that you don't do. Um, when was the first yeah. moment that you were like, oh, I, I kind of, this is a problem I need to stop or try to stop? Um, I don't really remember the first. I remember um, there was just uh, probably, I started working in a bar when I was about 21 and it was just you know like every single day like you're waking up and you like you have to drink to feel better and but then still I was justifying it like working in the bar industry Mm -hmm. I was like oh this is just a phase you know like I was always making it okay Mm -hmm. um but I think when I was about 24 and I had a codependent friend her and I moved in together and um we had the same problems and um I remember one day we had gone to the liquor store and we had to stop in the store beside the liquor store to have some shots because we were sick because we didn't have it in our system and we're trying to get the vodka down and I just looked at her and I said like when did this stop being fun and she's like I don't know and Um, I think that that moment, like there were many before I was 24 years old, but that just really stands out in in my Mm -hmm. mind. Um, yeah. And what, what did you, what kind of steps did you initially take to, um, trying to recover? Um, so I went to first, it was AA, which was, um, encouraged by my parents, um, I went to my first AA meeting when I was 24 and I think, I think I only went to one and I was just not ready. I was like, nope, I'm not doing this. Um, and then, so I continued on for another three years and, uh, I started going to meetings. It was all very fuzzy when I first started trying. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it was meetings and then the detox, um, place got me into the rehab and then I met somebody in the meetings who got me into the sober house um and I found AA it was really useful um for the connection and it made me want to stay sober to the extent that I wanted to see people and have something good Mm -hmm. to report to them you know like it and how do how do they how do they do it is it just talking about you know how you're doing um with each other if you're feeling like doing it or so they they goes through 12 steps like there's the 12 steps of AA um and so you are you know you can you can sit in the meetings and just listen to stories they usually will bring up a topic or they might have a speaker um and usually you'll get a sponsor so somebody who's had a certain amount of recovery mm-hmm. for a certain amount of time and has gone through the 12 steps um, uh, and then they help you do the same mm-hmm. uh, most rehabs are also based on 12-step programs okay. um, yeah so it's just like um, I can't even it was it's interesting like at one point you know you have them memor completely memorized I can't even remember all of them anymore but um, you know, admitting that you're powerless over alcohol mm-hmm. and kind of turning it over to something else and making amends and like that kind of stuff. So it goes through all those steps and you do that with a sponsor. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really kind of airing out your dirty laundry um, and just admitting that you can no longer run your life like the way you are. Yeah. Um, that sounds tough. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean... Um, the alcohol is never the problem. 
it's just a symptom like anything mm. else. You know, it's, it's what's, it's the reason why, um, that the drinking is happening. Mm-hmm. Um, that really needs to be addressed. So like the subconscious problems that you mentioned, um, in something I read. So, um, how does hypnotherapy like come into that? Um, did you, when did you discover hypnotherapy as well to kind of help you out? So I only discovered it a couple of years ago. Um, and through my recovery journey, it was never recommended to me. It was never suggested. I didn't know it was available. Mm -hmm. Um, it would have been really helpful to me if it was because I stopped drinking alcohol over nine years ago, but for years after that, I still had the problems that were running the behavior. Mm -hmm. Like they just, they just didn't come out in drug or alcohol addiction. They came out in other things, um, you know, over exercising and stuff like that. Um, because I hadn't resolved the problem Mm -hmm. that was, um, making or creating the behavior. Um, so I did try out like talk therapy and that kind of thing. Um, talk therapy, did you say? Yeah. What's the, yeah. what does that involve? So, so that's like one-on-one with a counselor or psychotherapist. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're just like discussing your problem and seeing it from different areas. And they're, you know, um, just kind of letting you, um, you know, express what's been going on. It's very, it's very useful for, to be able to have that person. If you don't have someone else in your life to just completely tell all of your secrets to, right. That is kind of like a non-judgmental party. Um, and they do like cognitive behavioral therapy and, um, stuff like that. But, uh, I didn't get it in my experience. Um, I didn't get a lot from that. I did a lot of my healing on my own, actually, through like self-help books Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, And since I discovered hypnotherapy in the last couple of years and then um, uh, became educated in it is where I continued to get my breakthroughs like that I hadn't gotten in the years in the years prior. Um, And it's just it's one of these things that I question because we lean on these mainstream ways to get sober, um, like AA, mm-hmm. and, but the success rate is so low, like relapse is high. Um, AA has about a 15% success wow. rate getting people sober. Yeah. But yet that's like the first thing people t- uh, tell you to do. Right. Um, and I mean, all of our problems are in the subconscious mind and there aren't any mainstream solutions that uh, utilize the subconscious mind to resolve your problem. Yeah. Um, and I wonder like why that is. And then I question, it's like, well, um, see my, my business model is that I don't want repeat clients. Mm-hmm. So when they come to me, I want, I don't, if they come back to me, then I haven't done my job. It's like properly. the reverse business model. <laughs> exactly. Right. It's like, it's like not the greatest. <laughs> I know, but I'm, I'm hoping to help, um, a lot of people mm-hmm. instead of a few people, a lot of times. Yeah. No, that sounds you really know. good. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I mean, hypnotherapy has. I think a lot of people think of the stage hypnotist and things like that when, when they think about it, um, because it was just kind of shoved on the back burner. Like it isn't talked about in mainstream, but I am trying to, um, yeah, educate and encourage that it is a very useful modality to resolve the problems because it, it works directly with the mind that's holding Mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Like, um, I would never have thought, you know, um, there's anything really other than AA. It's kind of AA is the only thing that ever really pops to anyone's mind when they think of like recovery from alcohol. You don't really often tend to consider other potential options. So there definitely there definitely needs to be more awareness on that that there are other options out there. 
Mm-hmm. Um, how does the hypnotherapy actually work? So usually when you think about hypnotherapy, I, I think there's this, um, this uh, idea of, you know, the client being put into a relaxed state and then receiving suggestions, you know, like um, um, to override their current thought processes. But the method that I use is actually, um, it's like a casual conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's only hypnosis to the extent that we're utilizing the subconscious mind. So the client can have breakthroughs and they're wide awake, they're just talking and it's eyes open. But when we talk about our problems, we give a lot of conscious information and a little bit of subconscious information. So it's my job to pull out that subconscious information. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the client, to the front of the client's mind, it's realized that it doesn't make sense and it doesn't work um, because our problems are illogical and stuck in the subconscious. Mm -hmm. But when you magnify it and bring it forward, then the problem collapses because it doesn't make sense in the conscious Mm. mind. Um, So it it is quite neat. I mean, I had this idea that clients needed to be, you know, completely like drooling on themselves (laughs) and eyes closed to get a big breakthrough. Um, But the depth of trance has nothing to do with the, um, how big the breakthrough is. That's really interesting. Um, Um, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was I going to say? So does it matter kind of what stage a person is in their addiction? So do they have to be wanting to get better and really willing to change for it to work, do you find? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that goes with any anything where the mind is really ready to let it mm-hmm. go. Um, is that the client has to consciously be very willing mm-hmm. and ready Um, to be done with it because the problem our problems are there but there is a big part of our mind that's receiving a payoff from the problem or it wouldn't be there Mm -hmm. you know usually our problems are there to um, protect us to punish us or to prioritize us to give attention and because the mind is receiving a payoff you need to really have the motivation to um, want to let that go it's like if someone was to call me and they had a spouse you know that was um, that they wanted to quit drinking Mm -hmm. that it would have to be the person who's drinking that has to have the motivation Mm -hmm. Um, because we can only ever really change for ourselves yeah and does it take uh, long for people do they have to have like multiple sessions over a long period of time or is it kind Um, of very for the client yeah it it varies but it is fast I do a model of one to three sessions really that's Mm -hmm. really that's that's quick yeah yeah so you find people Um, like are able to just let let it go after a few sessions yeah there is this thing that happens with the subconscious that once that reality is collapsed um there's what we call processing that happens in the subconscious mind that we can't tell um, consciously, but the subconscious then has access to all the resources that we've learned in our life up until that point that weren't able to get in there because of that really tight problem thought loop. So once we break that thought loop, they have their choice back. Mm, That's amazing. Which, yeah. So which when you're thinking about, when we're talking about addiction, it's like they have no choice, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, how did I get here again at the end of the day? Like I, something else is running my mind. I had no choice. So this gives them that choice back. Yeah. 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 I feel like that could be transferable as well into so many other areas of life, like other addictions, food addiction, smoking. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I have been successful with smoking and um, anxiety, um, uh, confidence and self-esteem, reaching goals. Wow. Yeah. So really anything that we're, anything that is presenting as a problem. That's so exciting. That's like, you could do so much with that. That's amazing. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's really cool. Really cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do, um, so each session, there's no time limit on a session because um, we really want the client to um, find those knots, so to speak, in their mind, those, those, prob those problem mm -hmm. loops. So I've, like, my shortest session has been a half an hour. My longest has been about two and a half hours. So however long we need... Mm -hmm to get to where they can that day mm -hmm. is yeah how we do and how do you know how do you kind of how do you realize that they're at that point is there something to spot or mm -hmm. so um sometimes a client will be quite um a little bit spacey like there's like when they think about the problem mm -hmm. like there's not a lot of justifying and um, understanding of the problem. It's almost like it is, isn't there at the moment um, because the reality of it has been broken. Um, yeah, I find that very common, that spaciness. Um, and just when you're asking, so what's the problem? And they say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Right. And then that's the mind's processing. Sometimes it takes um, like that day or it could take a few mm -hmm. days for the mind to to process. Um, sometimes a client will show a little bit of exhaustion, like because the mind is working so hard in the subconscious, just all the different things that are going on, that there will be, you know, where the client asks, it says, OK, like I'm that's it. I'm done. <laughs> I'm, I'm done, you know? Um, yeah, so there's there's different things, but what we're looking for is when, the, when there is space and the client can't find what the reason of the problem is. Nice. Yeah. Why do you think um, this isn't more mainstream? Why do you think it's not promoted more? Do you have any idea or thoughts on that? Um, I don't know. I... I don't know. Like I, I, I'm someone that always asks questions mm -hmm. I, when things don't make sense, um, and we can draw our own conclusions. But um, I feel that because I've seen how how quick change can happen with people in this method, mm -hmm. and um, how successful it's been over, you know. Um, hold all different types of things um I I don't know like I feel like we if we had people getting better really fast that there would be industries that wouldn't survive money <laughs> money is the answer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah for sure um I mean I saw my uh trainer um there, there was doing a demonstration and it's like one of the sessions there was um someone who had was really suffering the after effects of having covid mm -hmm. and it was like eight months after and she had been experiencing this exhaustion she couldn't work she couldn't really leave the house much and you could tell at the beginning of the session like she was coughing quite a bit and you could tell the her chest mm -hmm. and it was about an hour after um the cough had gone and the feeling in her chest was gone. And wow. in a follow up with her, she was able to just like easily walk up the street to go to the store where she couldn't do that before. That's crazy. You know? Yeah. And it ended up being um, linked to uh, anxiety, um, which ha have been resolved in that session. So, I mean, when you can, if, if you have something that can, you know, help people that much I don't know I feel like there is just it's um that some industries would not survive yeah I feel like there is so much money in sickness do you know there, mm -hmm. I, I just I feel like some of these big industries they they want people to be sick because it makes them money and they don't really care about the effects it has on others yeah uh, absolutely I, well, I, um, so during this process, a couple of months ago, I, I saw my doctor and 
he was asking what I was doing these days. Um, and he mentioned that before they came out with anxiety and depression medication, he was trained in hypnotherapy. Really? And that's, what, yeah. And that's what they would use on their patients. How long ago would that be? Do you know? You know what? I'm not exactly sure. I mean, he's, he's almost retired. So I would maybe say, I don't know, maybe like 30 years, 40 years. I would have to look it up to be sure, but that's just my thought based on how old he is and maybe when he was. Mm -hmm. Are there many studies but, done on hypnotherapy? Do you know? Um, yes, there are. Um, I don't have um, any on me, but. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when I had, yeah, when I had looked at, uh, like when I was doing some of my research, um, even for content, mm -hmm. when I'm putting up content and just trying to um, put out a little bit more about hypnotherapy, um, um, when you look through Google, like a lot of the, it really downplays it. Yes. Um, Google yeah, is very, they show you what they want you to see. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And it's like, you know, saying things like, you know, it's, it's good as um, an addition to, you know, and then all the other things that we already lean on, um, you know, saying that it's, it's useful for like weight loss and smoking and that kind of stuff, but it doesn't mention that, you know, you can use it as a standalone mm -hmm. for a ton of things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure if the method of giving suggestions, the client's suggestions could be used as a lot. I mean, that, that method absolutely does have its place. And when our minds are open to receive those suggestions, there, there can be very lasting change. Um, unfortunately, what can be a problem with that is if you give a client a suggestion and they're not ready to receive it, they might negate it and it's never an option for them ever oh, really? again. It's like, yeah. It's almost like giving someone advice. Mm -hmm. You know, if you give someone advice and they can tell you, it sounds like good advice, but they can tell you all the reasons why it's not going to work, mm -hmm. you know, so you've just almost taken that option away from them Yeah. by giving them, by giving them an opening of resistance. Um, but when you literally just use what's in the client's mind and the information they're giving you, then they're resolving their own problem. Yeah. So it's... With it's like their own idea mm -hmm. so they're yeah. already thinking of it so it's kind of right in their mind yeah and they'll pull out r new resources that only make sense to mm -hmm. them and their situation because we have like with with addiction you can have you know 20 people that have all the same addiction and it looks the same on the outside but every single one of them got to that place differently mm -hmm. you know so they they need their own resources and their own formula yeah personalized um, yeah yeah absolutely yeah but I'm really um I'm really hoping that um that people are open to learning um alternative methods to mainstream because I do think we need to we need to ask questions more mm -hmm. critical thinking you know, when, <laughs> Absolutely. And, and when things aren't working, um, not only for other people, but for ourselves, mm -hmm. um, to then, you know, do a little bit of our own research, think outside the box and um, think of what other things that might be an option if, if the mainstream stuff is just not working. Yeah, for sure. Have you, have yeah. you had any pushback from... Um, starting this kind of business because you know that it's not something that's mainstream or promoted um i was just curious push back in what so way? just yeah. i don't know just like people saying oh you know it's not scientifically backed or something like that um i haven't i haven't so far um I mean, I have had, um, no, I think I, I just had, uh, 
psychologist um, contacted me to to ask how, like, inquire about the fast transformations. Mm -hmm. We haven't had our discussion yet, um, but I'm always happy to um, let people know what I know when they ask, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, um, Yeah, just if they're asking about information, because it does seem like something, like when we hear about that, it's like, you know, how is that even a mm. thing? But I haven't, I haven't had direct pushback. Um, I think the only pushback that I've had has been silent, silence, and that is just um, a lack of response through my social media marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do believe that that might be because it isn't, it's a little bit alternative. Mm-hmm. And we have so many, um, well, well, many people do have their own idea of what hypnosis Mm -hmm. is yeah I guess there's like that stereotype that you kind of picture when you first think of hypnosis yeah absolutely so um I think that that has just been pushed back Mm -hmm. just um just in a passive way but um I feel that you know I just keep putting you know just keep trying to educate and put out content and I'm I'm hoping that um the idea will be opened up to yeah no I think it's a great idea do you think that um most do you find that most people like if you suggest it to them they would be like quite open to trying it um I do believe so because I can um I can discuss it right Mm -hmm. there you know and like answer any of their questions um I think that with you know even when I post testimonials and stuff like that like those are real people right and so you can't really argue Mm -hmm. that um when you know after a session there's been you know x amount of breakthroughs um so i feel like yeah that's what just needs to happen is just more inquiring and um uh, more understanding about the process Mm -hmm. yeah yeah um so i feel like so many people uh drink nowadays and I feel like it's become such a big part of our culture um and I think it's probably more of a issue than people realize um Mm -hmm. and I'm even surprised that like big brands can advertise in the way that they do you know because it is essentially a drug Um, like you're not allowed to advertise cigarettes anymore so it's kind of like Mm -hmm. why do you think alcohol is the same I mean it's different (laughs) yeah Um, again I feel that it is a money thing Mm. to be honest Um, I mean when even when you look at the when everything closed because of the pandemic liquor stores are now are an essential they have to be open it's an are essential they an essential service. even if you're just sell, selling alcohol yeah wow it was essential and um wow. i mean i could understand maybe if they're you know they kept open a little shop maybe for people who had alcohol addiction because they could get really sick if they didn't have it but not as I feel that if they closed the, the, the stores completely, there would be real problems in our society. Like that would not have gone well. Mm -hmm. That would have caused the riots, you know, not the small businesses closing and them suffering. Like if alcohol went out, that would be, you know, that's crazy. (laughs) I I did not know that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it does cost, uh, um, I had just, I had recently done a video about, um, you know, how the, uh, alcohol culture in business, um, and, you know, doing, um, um, uh, making deals and, you know, that kind of thing over drinks, like in business and how alcohol has, has a big place. Um, and I had found some articles that supported that and um, that it's usefulness in socializing and that kind of thing. But then I also found articles that said the billions of dollars every year that it costs business wow. in deficit. Yeah. Because of, you know, illness, you know, absenteeism, mental health, mm-hmm. 
all of that kind of stuff. It's billions of dollars every year, but that's not really advertised. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, any kind of special occasion, whether it's like Christmas, New Year's, um, like people drink and it's not just one drink or two drinks. I find people mm-hmm. just, they drink as much as they can a lot of the time. Um, mm-hmm. And like, that's that's considered the norm. Um, and I think mm-hmm. even if you have a high tolerance, it's still, and you can drink more and not feel the effects, like it's still damaging you internally as well. Like it's still not um, a good thing if you can drink a lot, I feel like. And then it also has like um, a big effect on like paramedics and people, you know, who would be out like their workload, like on heavy mm-hmm. nights out and occasions mm-hmm. throughout the year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think in first responders, it's a real, it's a big problem. Um, not only just because, you know, people get together to drink. But then also when you are, you know, experiencing a high stress job and that we all, we often look at alcohol as that solution, Mm -hmm. you know, to relieve stress. To relax, yeah. Yeah, to relax. Where in actuality, it makes our anxiety worse. You know, when it's, it, it might, it's instant gratification, but as alcohol is actually leaving the system, it makes all of those things that you are trying to combat worse Mm -hmm. on the other side. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was a drinker. I understand the social thing, but like when we step back and we really see what it does, um, it's quite toxic to our society, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah, yeah, I was someone, I I recently had seen a, a Facebook post. Someone had mentioned about, um, uh, in the UK, how, like after football games and things like that. Like if you see um, sometimes what happens in the streets, like due to alcohol yeah, <laughs> and like how rowdy the crowd is. Not just after football games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Like all the time. <laughs> just anything that involves game. alcohol probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's just like how, um, you know, it's just like adults like going mad <laughs> yeah a little bit yeah <laughs> especially yeah. when everyone's there and there's like camaraderie and everyone's like hyped up about winning or something it's like yeah. adds fuel to the fire yeah yeah absolutely oh yeah you get it's like the the um mob mentality mm-hmm. for sure mm-hmm. yeah but i do um I mean, I think that alcohol just brings in a ton of money, Mm. you know? Yeah, at the end of the day, that's kind of the main thing that keeps it at the forefront of society, probably. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, I have found, and I'm not just saying this because I'm sober, but I have, like when you learn how to socialize and be confident in who you are without anything added, Mm -hmm. like when you can go to a party or you do this just as yourself and have real fun, like it is the greatest feeling ever. Like knowing that you don't have to have that thing to have more fun, Mm -hmm. you know? And if, if, but I think if we were a more confident self, full of self-esteem society, um, you know, a lot of these systems that we lean on would fail. Mm-hmm. You know? They, the, um, all the systems that bank on us being unhealthy to a degree. Yeah. I mean, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, and I was going to say, yeah, that's like, apart from feeling relaxed, like confidence is one of the reasons people like to drink. So for sure, if people like have more confidence in themselves, it Mm -hmm. would feel better to remain sober. And then the next day you'll feel better as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're feeling good. You're actually like, yeah, it's not taking you a couple days to recover. Um, 
I mean, if we even think about the health and beauty industry, if we were all really confident, they wouldn't mm -hmm. survive. You know, we basically buy their products because we feel that we need to, we are lacking in some way. Yeah, that we feel like we need to live up to particular standards. Mm -hmm. And put off like a particular persona and air about us. Um, yeah. When really everyone is just totally insecure. <laughs> yes, right, right. And um, it's like, who? Are, what are we trying to do? Like, who's setting these standards? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes I look at the fashion that comes out and I'm like, are we really doing this? <laughs> It gets worse and worse sometimes. <laughs> it does. Like, I'm, I don't know what happened this year. I was trying to just go out. I went out shopping the other day and I was like, I don't know what I'm, I'm going to have to continue wearing old clothes because I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I just so don't on. shop anymore. <laughs> no. And that's going to have to be my plan. I know I'm like, you know, button ups. <laughs> 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 yeah. But, um, yeah, if we had that, um, and that's another thing that I, I, I would love to empower people that it's, um, you know, that to, to work on that inner confidence, like, and when you do, there's so much in your life that changes, you know, your, your relationships and, you know, you figure out what you actually want to do in life and, you know, all that stuff. And then we can stop feeding all those industries. That would be mm -hmm. nice. And treating ourselves better and like looking after our health in all sorts of ways as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And doing, um, and um, I was just, I had done a video about, um, you know, people when they hit, have you heard of like a midlife crisis? Mm -hmm. And when it's almost like you come to this point. I mean, I guess it's a very, it's not fun to be in one, but it's like they come to this point where you've been, you know, reaching goals of that aren't your own and trying to attain things that our society um, puts on, you know, says is, you know, looks like a successful life. Mm -hmm but might not be your own goals and your, your own idea of a successful life. And then it's like, you know, you get to this point and it's like, what am I doing? Like, it's like this emptiness. Like I need to do this and try this and try this because I haven't yet found myself because we're so outwardly focused. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. It's just like, you kind of, you go to school, you get an education, maybe you get a degree or something, and it's like you're on autopilot and you're constantly been like directed to do this thing and follow this path and you keep following and then you're like, wait, where am I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's like, okay, get the spouse, okay, got the kids, I'm doing the 40 hours of work a week to pay for all this stuff that I'm not even sure I want, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then it's like, where's the life, mm -hmm. you know, where do you, where do you come in? Right. It's just, yeah. Trying to keep up with society and doing what's like considered normal. Like, oh, you should be doing this because it's normal because everyone else does it. But really like, we're all so different. We'll all probably be wanting to do such different things. Absolutely. Yeah. And there is honestly, there's, it's such a great feeling to not do what others are doing and feel good in doing that, mm -hmm. you know, and I, cause you just yeah. need great for you. I feel like, and it's scary at times, but it's like when you push yourself outside of your comfort zone, that's kind of when you grow and you get more yeah. confident. Absolutely. It's like if, if you're uncomfortable, then you know you're doing it right. Yeah. And then you can just Absolutely. build on top and get more confident and more confident. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like just through your own, yeah, through yourself. And um, when you start driving your life instead of letting, you know, whatever's going on outside of you take you for a ride. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And what do you think of the 
age restriction on alcohol because in america well in america it's 21 in canada what is it in canada 19 19 and then it i think it's 18 in the uk but you can have drinks when you're 16 um if you're supervised um i mean i think 16 seems pretty young Mm -hmm. But that's just, I think about what I was like when I was 16, and, you know, not responsible at all. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I can't, they've, I think we just have to educate better mm-hmm. on, um, you know, on what abusing it can do. Um, but more so, even encourage kids to be more confident in themselves because when they get to that stage of using alcohol Mm -hmm. I don't think they would go as overboard at parties or you know like have a tendency to lean on it as much Mm -hmm. um, if we were you know encouraging more self-esteem and um, individuality Mm -hmm. for sure um yeah but then outside of that I think it's just um yeah just educating I mean we're gonna people are gonna do what they're gonna do anyways right and some of us have to learn the hard way Mm -hmm. like we'll we'll know about it I'm I'm like I I probably knew all about it how damaging it was and I'm like yeah anyways (laughs) (laughs) but but I was also very um my confidence was very low Mm -hmm. you know so I was just like nope I've got the remedy that's going to make me feel better. Yeah, I know everything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think as, for sure. I think as well, like, um, you know, if you're like, you cannot have something, like, it's totally bad, never have it, you're banned from having it, that kind of creates, like, a forbidden fruit, and it's like, ooh, well, I really want to try that, you know? I feel mm-hmm. like if you're a little bit, well, you can have a sip you can try it you know it's, and mm-hmm. not be um too like you know restrictive mm-hmm. I think that can be better than being overly restrictive yeah I've I absolutely agree I mean I had um I had lived in two households so my dad's was was more lax and laid back and my mom's was um quite Um, was a little bit more strict and drugs or alcohol or any of that would have been a complete faux pas Mm -hmm. in smoking um I I started smoking when I was 14 because that was the first you know introduction into something that I wasn't supposed to be doing I was like oh yeah that sounds good (laughs) remember it was terrible at the beginning like I hated it but I just kept doing it (laughs) Because it was like, you know, something fun and like outrageous yeah. that like I could get in trouble for. Um, so I think there's def there's definitely that factor there, of the forbidden fruit. Absolutely, got to try it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think lastly, or second lastly, mm-hmm. do you have any advice for someone that is struggling with addiction? Um. Yes, I would first say that don't feel ashamed over it. Absolutely don't be ashamed of it. Be honest with yourself and where you are and um, ask someone and reach out for help because you'll be very surprised who will come out of the woodwork and help you. And actually going through these really hard things is a great way of understanding who is really there for you in your life. So anybody that you do feel wouldn't accept you or, you know, that just means that that person wasn't meant to be in your life. Um, so yeah, be, be honest with yourself and, um, reach out and, um, you know, there are, there are different ways to address addiction. Um, if there is a way that doesn't resonate with you and it's not going to work, don't be hard on yourself and just, um, find another method that will work for you because there'll be something that I mean I do believe we all have different formulas for success Mm -hmm. 
And just because it works for someone else doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And just, um, if you want, if you really want to get sober, you will find the right method for you. Well yeah. said. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> and have I missed anything that you think is important or you would like to cover? I think that I just wanted to um, mention that I think addiction in our society is a lot more prevalent than we believe it to be. Um, we have these kind of stigmas and beliefs about people who are right into drug and alcohol addiction um but they're just like anybody else mm -hmm. um they just show their addiction in a different way and i think that um because we are becoming it seems like that we have all this technology that is supposed to connect us it actually has become quite disconnecting and um I think that the more we become disconnected from ourselves and from our ability to communicate with others, the more we look at, um, we have the potential to become addicted. And that could be, um, you know, some sort of addiction in the way that we look or addiction to social media or toxic relationships. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we all have that potential within us. Um, it's not just you know, something that you have to be born with or nothing tra absolutely traumatic has to happen in your life for it to happen. I think that we are um, starting to um, encourage a society that um, um, encourages addiction mm -hmm. in others in, in different forms, um, stemming from a disconnect with ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think... Um you know, you can't always see addiction. Um, mm -hmm. It can be quite invisible for a lot of people. So I guess it's mm -hmm. important to just um, check in with like your friends and family when you can and make mm -hmm. sure that they're doing okay. Yeah, absolutely. And um, check in with yourself. Like, are you being honest with yourself? Um, are you doing things that you enjoy? Um, you know, what, what are the parts of your life that are holding your back or, you know, what are problems that are coming up? How are you talking to yourself every day? Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Cause they're the words that we say to ourselves dictate the way we feel. And so how, what are the words that you're saying to yourself? And, you know, if you don't like something, you know, our words are just habits. We can always change a habit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. we have the power to change <laughs> absolutely yeah we just need awareness and honesty with ourselves. we can really change we can change most things about yourself absolutely well thank yeah. you so much for coming on it's been really interesting and fun talking to you um yeah, thank you so i really admire time. what you do and i really hope that you know you get the hang of the marketing <laughs> <laughs> me too <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> thank you so much you're welcome yeah